The Sony a7 is a 9 year old full frame mirrorless camera that shoots 24 megapixel stills and 1080p video. And I know, I know that doesn't sound amazing, especially by 2022 standards, but this camera has impressed me for a bevy of reasons since I got it, but it also has a couple of hiccups here and there. Okay, so I'll get this out of the way first. Do I recommend the Sony a7 in 2022? Well, it heavily, and I mean heavily, depends on your budget. There are newer, faster, and more capable cameras, but they don't quite make them like this anymore. If you've ever used any of the Sony Alpha series, you'll know what this camera pretty much feels like in the hand. It is not entirely huge, but it's definitely bigger than any of the Sony APS-C cameras out there. The grip isn't the deepest, as your fingers might have to bend a little if you have long fingers like I do, but I haven't found it to be a problem at all since I got this camera. I love the fact that there are a lot of buttons on the body, as it gives the camera a retro type of aesthetic, and it just feels cool and vintage whenever I use it. On the top, you have your mode dial to switch between manual, automatic, panoramic mode, and so on. You also have your toggle to switch the camera on and off. And above the toggle, you have your shutter button, which is silver in color. You also have a dial to increase or decrease the exposure in real time while you're shooting, which is something I found to be really helpful and useful as you don't have to go into the settings to adjust exposure. Now you get what I mean by this camera just feels very retro and vintage. There are so many buttons everywhere. And it might not be for everyone, but it's definitely to my taste. There is also another dial at the back located where your thumb would rest, which you can use to change the aperture depending on the type of lens you use with the camera. And a lot of these buttons can be reassigned in the menu. For example, if you want the dial at the front to change your aperture or your shutter speed, you can do that. The a7 also has a 3 inch 640 by 480 RGBW screen at the back. Unfortunately, the screen does not rotate. It only flips out. So you're going to need an external monitor if you want to record video with this while monitoring yourself. And trust me, you're going to want that external monitor as I have been out of focus way too many times because I was recording video using the manual focus and I just did not know that I was out of focus. I'm the only one who records my videos, so there's no cameraman to tell me if I'm in focus or not. And why was I using manual focus? Why not use autofocus? Well, that is a very interesting story. But if you've been enjoying the video so far, then a sub to the channel would be picture perfect. Unfortunately, the 2013 Sony a7 does not have the best autofocus out there, at least when it comes to videos. The autofocus when it comes to pictures is quite nice, it is fast, it is crisp, and depending on what settings you have assigned, it can focus on a wide plane. However, when it comes to autofocus in videos, I have found this to be quite slow and unreliable as it does a lot of focus hunting even when my face is fully in the frame. Granted, I attribute this to the fact that I wear glasses because when my glasses are not on my face, it doesn't seem to have any issues focusing. One small workaround I found from this was to reduce the aperture from f1.8 to about f2.8 or f3.2. And I really don't want to do that because the whole reason I got an f1.8 50mm lens was to attain this very nice creamy bokeh or background blur that you can see right now. And if I'm to reduce the aperture, it's going to diminish the effect quite a bit. So yeah, I, I really want this depth of field. I think it looks nice. I spoke to a few of my friends who are more experienced in photography and videography, one of whom is Anthony from Anthony World. I actually watched his video on the Sony a7 before I went out to purchase mine and he has been really really helpful with regards to figuring out the right settings and experimenting with me to find out just how to make the autofocus better and overall he's just been an amazing guy. I have been a very big bother in his Twitter DMs but he has been very gracious and helpful. So go over to his channel, watch a couple of his videos and show him some love right after you're done with this one. The next person who has been really helpful with regards to transitioning from smartphone videography to camera videography has been my friend Fenson from the channel Gadgetsu. He's the one who made me understand that most of the quality you get from the camera heavily depends on your lighting and he has been really instrumental in helping me figure out which lighting setup is the best, how to prevent reflections from getting into my glasses, and things like that. Obviously, I'm still trying to get a lot of things figured out and this is far from the perfect setup, but I think a lot of improvement has been made and most of that is thanks to Fenson. So you can go over to his channel Gadgetsu and show him some love as well. 
earlier, I mentioned how I like the vintage aesthetic of this device. However, it is vintage not only in appearance, but in function as well. It does not have a touch screen, meaning you're going to have to navigate the menus using this rotating navigation dial located on the right side of the camera. And although this has been updated to the latest firmware, it is still quite confusing to access some of the options as you would have to go into menus and sub menus to find particular things that you might be looking for. But personally, I haven't spent a lot of time in the menus as most of the settings I need can be found on the buttons. You have your auto focus and manual focus toggle. You have your auto exposure lock. You have the function button, which will give you access to an entirely different menu. Think of it as a quick settings menu, like the one you have on your smartphone if you're an Android user, like me. Then you have the buttons to show you the media that you have taken and to delete them. You also have your video record button off to the side. There's a 1024 by 768 electronic viewfinder at the top, but I mostly stick to using the monitor. This camera also has Wi-Fi and NFC capabilities, and you can install some apps on it via the Play Memories platform. The battery door is located at the bottom as expected, and the SD card slot is hidden in the grip on the right. At the left of the camera, you have the microphone and the headphones ports in case you would like to use a shotgun microphone with this camera, or you would like to plug in some headphones to monitor your audio. And trust me, you're gonna wanna use an external microphone with this camera because, well, this is the audio quality from the Sony A7. Yeah. Not the most pleasant listening experience, is it? I know. Below the 3.5 millimeter port, you also have the charging port, which is micro USB, and you have a micro HDMI port as well, for connecting to your external monitor. So the hardware is pretty good for 2013 standards, honestly, but with regards to 2022, the lack of a rotating screen and the inclusion of micro USB might be the deal breaker for a lot of people. Personally, I don't mind though. I like retro things sometimes, sometimes. With regards to quality, this camera still holds up depending on what you expect to use it for. It's definitely not meant to be used for sports photography or anything that requires bursts of speed as it does not capture pictures very rapidly. One advantage is a 24.3 megapixel full frame CMOS sensor which means that your videos will not be cropped in any form when you are recording. A disadvantage is the fact that it only goes up to 1080p 60 frames per second when it comes to video recording, so you cannot use this for 4K recording. It comes with Sony's E-mount system for lenses, meaning it supports the E lenses and perhaps the FE and A mount lenses if you can get the adapter. One thing to take note of is if you would like to change your frame rate or you want to shoot in 1920x1080p, then you're going to have to leave the recording format in AVC HD and not change it to MP4. As if you switch to MP4, the recording resolution switches to 1440 by 1080p and it's going to leave your footage a bit distorted as it's in a different aspect ratio. You also don't have the option to change frame rates when recording in MP4. All the A-roll you've seen in this video has been shot by the Sony A7, and here are some sample images as well in different lighting conditions. Of course, I'm not a professional photographer. I am the literal definition of amateur, or beginner, or even kindergarten photographer. This is practically my first professional camera, but I believe that this camera is simple enough for anyone to pick up, play around with for a few minutes, and understand what needs to be done. It produces very nice images, very sharp, and you have the option to shoot in RAW, JPEG, or a combination of JPEG and RAW, which will take one RAW image and one JPEG image while you shoot. But of course, you can always get much better quality and much more personalized images and videos depending on your settings, the lenses you use, and your editing skills. So is the Sony a7 still a good buy in 2022? I would say pretty much, but it still does have a number of caveats one of which is the autofocus issue I mentioned earlier, and another is the fact that this camera overheats quite a bit. A workaround I found for the overheating issue was to pull out the screen from the body while recording and open the battery door as well to help with heat dissipation. This helped take my recording time from about 15 minutes at a time to 25 or 30 minutes at a time, which is more than enough for me to record all the A-roll I need. But you need to keep this in mind if you're someone who wants to do long recording or shooting sessions and you are considering this camera. I got this camera for about $450 with a 50 millimeter lens, and for that price, I don't think you'll be able to get another option that will deliver this amount of quality and still be in such good condition, especially on the used market. Sony's color science is top notch, 
you have a bevy of interchangeable lenses to choose from and you can be rest assured that you are going to get amazing quality because Sony simply doesn't miss when it comes to cameras. Not that I know of anyway. Some other options you could look at if you're thinking of getting your first camera would be the Sony ZV-E10 or the Sony ZV-1. Both are great options but they are quite a bit more expensive than the Sony A7 as those would cost you upwards of $800 or so and the Sony ZV-1 only has an inbuilt lens so if you're planning on switching out your lenses that is not the camera for you. So far I've had an amazing time with the Sony A7. There have been some frustrations here and there but of course there is no perfect product. And for about $450, I get amazing quality, a reliable experience, and my interchangeable lenses. But for some people, the overheating, micro USB, lack of a rotating screen or 4K recording, and the autofocus issues might be the reason they skip out on this camera, which is quite understandable, of course. For those people, I would recommend saving up a bit more and taking a look at the Sony A7R or maybe some of the newer Sony Alpha cameras if you're looking for a full frame sensor. And if the size of the sensor doesn't really matter to you, then you can take a look at any of Sony's APS-C line from the A6100 and beyond. Let me know what you think in the comment section right below the like button. I will definitely be spending more time with this camera and I will be producing more videos about my experience with it moving forward. And if you enjoyed this video, then you can check out my video on the iPhone 14, what we can expect from that, or you can check out any of the videos in this playlist. But before you go there, subscribe to the channel.